around the middle of last year when it looked like the Taliban were increasing their control over Afghanistan. And then as, as weeks went by in August last year, when it became quite evident that Taliban will take over and dramatically they took over Afghanistan. There was a lot of concern in India about what will happen to India's interests now that Pakistan's allies had taken over in Afghanistan. And the larger fear was that Afghan soil will now become a breeding ground for terror groups operating against India and the Taliban, the Pakistan will bark in cahoots to then give trouble to India, especially in the Kashmir region. At that point, we had said, I had, I had also stuck my ne neck out and said, leave off to Pak. Remember, uh, in the Western world, they said Af Pak region. So we said, leave Af to Pak. That Pakistan has been wanting to control Afghanistan for a long time. Now, their prayers have been answered. They have their own clients in Afghanistan, they have a client state of, of their own, so let them deal with it. And the feeling was that instead of becoming a trouble for us, or even before it becomes a trouble for us in India, an Afghanistan as anarchic as that, and an Afghanistan under the Taliban will become trouble for Pakistan. And also we had said that Pakistan, if they try to then control Afghanistan, fight there, it's not going to work, because this is, this is a country which has defeated the world's three preeminent superpowers at the peak of their power. So they defeated the British in the 19th century, they defeated Soviet Union in the 20th century, and they defeated America in the 21st century when it was the lone superpower for a long time. So let the Pakistanis also try their luck. If they think that they can use Afghanistan against India or in their own interest or, or or in the quest for, in the search for what they describe as strategic depth. Now, we can say quite clearly, at least for now, that we've been vindicated. Those of us who said that India should not get caught in a power game with Pakistan in Afghanistan, let the Pakistanis savor their victory such as it is, and they will get to know what this means. At least now, for now, we can feel vindicated. Because what's happening there is that instead of becoming a cradle or a sanctuary for anti-India terrorists, for now it has become a massive sanctuary for anti-Pakistan terrorists. That is Tariqe Taliban Pakistan. Not just that, now Pakistan government, even the new government, because essentially the governments change, but the establishment remains, that is the armed forces and ISI, they are now negotiating, Pakistan is negotiating with Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, that is Pakistani Taliban, through the good offices of the Afghan Taliban. Earlier, they had thought that the moment Afghan Taliban come in, they will either destroy Pakistani Taliban or force them to make peace with Pakistan. The opposite happened. For about a year now, it is the Pakistan Taliban who have been creating havoc in the border areas of Pakistan. I'll, I'll give you some, list, some little listing of what's happened lately. Now, the Pakistanis are negotiating with them through the Afghan Taliban. So the latest round of negotiations is currently taking place. A group of 50 tribal leaders or tribal headmen, Jirga as it's called, Jirga means a committee or a group or a parliament in the tribal tradition. 50 of them are headed to Kabul to talk with the Pakistan Taliban through the good offices of Afghan Taliban. Now, what's happened meanwhile? You might remember that we had done a, an episode of Karta Karta some time back when Pakistan got so hassled, so angry after a major attack by TTP, Tariq -e Taliban Pakistan, that they had carried out bombing attacks inside Afghan territory. So, they were just as India were so bothered at one point that they carried out transborder raids after the attack on the Uri Brigade headquarters. In this case, the Pakistanis did that, except that they also used air power and artillery power. And that had led to a situation where Afghan government had said, Afghan spokesman has said that this will lead to a war between the two neighbors. So at that point, Pakistanis were also reminded of the fact that no matter who's in power in Kabul, 
Afghan sovereignty or Afghan Afghan belief in their sovereignty is also a reality, and that cuts across tribal groups, party lines, etc., etc. Now Pakistan has had to reach out to the same Taliban government, Afghan Taliban government, to help them. So with that, their help in the latest round of negotiations, they have decided to extend their so-called ceasefire again. So this cease, this ceasefire was to was to expire on 30th May, that is yesterday, given that I am recording this on 31st May. Now, this has been extended all thanks to Afghan Taliban. So, in fact, this Pakistan delegation, which has gone to Kabul, they are also talking, holding separate meetings. They are holding uh, their meeting and the TTP leaders are meeting, acting Prime Minister of Afghanistan, Mullah Mohammad Hassan, Akhund. Both are meeting him. So he's the big shot. He's making peace now. He's not selling away TTP to Pakistan government. Pakistan government may be his patrons, but he's not letting down. Another group, a Pakistani group, which also goes by the name of Taliban, and he cannot do it because these tribes on the border regions are all interconnected. If he, if he sells them back to the Pakistanis, then their kinsmen will might rebel. So that is why Taliban also are playing a hard game, a hard ball with Pakistan. They see TTP as leverage for them, not vis-a-vis -vis India, not vis-a-vis -vis China, but vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. And they are using that fully. Now, what is it that TTP is demanding? TTP is demanding, among other things, compensation for their dead and wounded in military operations as yet. And military operations have been going on for a long time. You might remember when Earlier attacks peaked with the big assault on Islamabad International Airport. Pakistan armed forces had carried out what was called as Operation Zarbe Azam, right? And that is when air power was used, artillery was used, attack helicopters were, 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 were used. Many people died and Pakistan armed forces also suffered very heavy casualties. Then it looked like TTP had lost most of its strength. Now. Since the Taliban have taken over in Kabul, instead of weakening, they become enormously more powerful. So I will just give you an example of what happens. Difference between any classical situation where forces friendly to you take over power or a situation like Afghanistan. Now in 1971, East Pakistan became liberated. It became Bangladesh. Until then, a lot of the Mizorebels, particularly also Nagas in some cases, not that many, but Mizorebels in particular were all in mostly in Chittagong Hill track. The moment the regime changed, the Mizorebels weakened. They weakened, weakened, weakened so much that ultimately they made full total peace with India in two rounds. In one round, a bunch of them came over ground. In the other round, everybody came over ground and MNF became a political, political party. Rajiv Gandhi signed a record with the MNF and later ruled the state and has remained a political party since then. It's been the most peaceful state in the Northeast in insurgency terms. The opposite has happened in Afghanistan. Why? One, because of tribal loyalties. Second, because Afghan Taliban have never learned to govern like a conventional government. And third, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, differences are deep and differences are so deep that they are not, they are not buried under the weight of the gratitude for Pakistan's help in defeating Pakistan's most important ally, that is America. So while they say, thank you, Pakistan, but the burden of history is so strong and the dispute over the borders and tribal loyalties which cut across that undefined border because Pakistan says Durand line is the border. Taliban say no, all Afghans have said no, no Afghan ruler has as yet accepted the Durand line. And in this case also, after the Taliban took over, Pakistan got emboldened and they started erecting a fence on the Durand line and that immediately got a pushback from the Afghan Taliban. So it doesn't matter whether it's a Taliban government, it is a leftist government, communist government or a pro-American government, no government or before that royal governments, no government in Afghanistan accepts the Durand line as the border with Pakistan, nor does this government make any distinction. So this government has that leverage and this government is now playing with that leverage. Now this committee that's gone from Pakistan now, obviously ISI and 
RB people are behind the scenes and they are doing the real stuff. But this committee is headed by a Molana, a Molana from the same region that is the KPK plus FATA federally administered tribal areas as it used to be. So one of the demands that the TTP now has is that their region, which that FATA region, federally administered tribal areas, which were merged into KPK, that is Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, they should be demerged and they should be back to being an autonomous region. Pakistani army should withdraw from there. All cases should be withdrawn, as I told you, reparations uh, and compensation to the wounded and the family of the dead, etc., etc. Basically, they want almost like a sovereign Islamic republic of their own. They also want Sharia law in that area. So even this delegation is headed by Molana, the Pakistani delegation. It's headed by Molana Saleh Shah. It also then has Molanas from or tribal bosses from South Waziristan, North Waziristan, Oragzai, Kurram, Khyber. See the map. You will see these uh, regions in the frontier areas. Khyber, Momant, Bajor, and Malakand. Malakand is the most contested area because that is where the Taliban want definitely the Sharia law imposed. Now, we had recorded one more episode of Cut the Clutter last year, in the winter of last year, when Imran Khan's government had signed on a one-month peace agreement, a one-month ceasefire with the Taliban. And we had then explained how much Pakistan government had conceded to their own Taliban, that is TTP. For example, they had let go of about a hundred jailed TTP terrorists, right? That was just, just for a month's ceasefire. And there was a lot of protest also in Pakistan because it is TTP that had carried out that big horrible massacre in the army public school in Peshawar, killing more than 150 children. And these were children of armed forces officers mostly. So there was a lot of, lot of protest in Pakistan. In spite of that, Imran went ahead with that ceasefire. But that ceasefire wasn't extended because TTP thought they were rampant, that they were, they were, they were the ones who had the upper hand, so they refused to extend that ceasefire. After that, another ceasefire came into being in the month of May. That is what was ending. That's what, what's been extended. But before that, what happened? From April 2, TTP announced the launch of another operation, another major operation, and they called it Operation Badr. Now, Operation Badr was their idea of using the Ramzan period to regularly attack Pakistan armed and police forces. Now, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Because in most places in Ramzan time, you order a ceasefire. The boring sites agree to a ceasefire. In this case, Tariq Taliban Pakistan said that we are launching a new offensive as the month of Ramzan begins. And lots of attacks were then carried out. I'll give you a little laundry list in a couple of minutes. Lots of attacks were carried out. Then around Eid, they agreed on a little ceasefire. So they said, all right, say from 1st to the 10th of May, ceasefire, that was generally the Eid period. And, once, and then it was again extended by a week and so on and so forth. But see what's been happening during the ceasefire. That's very important. May 23, that's just about a week back, two Pakistani soldiers were shot and killed in Mirali area in North Waziristan. That's May 23. May 17, two policemen were killed in, Ga in Ghazni Khel in Lucky or Laki Marwat district and their weapons were taken away. On May 15, that is two weeks back, on May 15, three army men and three children, they were killed in a suicide attack in Miran Shah, again in North Waziristan. April 20, April 20, three policemen were shot in Bada Ajab Talab. April 13, seven soldiers were killed in an ambush. Their vehicle was ambushed and in the ambush, automatic weapons and rocket propelled grenade launchers were used. April 11, five policemen were killed in a place called Yadgar in Dera Ismail Khan district. A lot of the people whose parents and grandparents came in from, uh, from, from Pakistan uh, at the time of partition will remember DIK. A lot of them came, a lot of the Hindus came from DIK district, Dera Ismail Khan district. So in Dera Ismail Khan district, five cops were killed on April 11 when the van they were riding near Chok Yadgar, that was hit with a rocket propelled grenade launcher. And the DSP of the place suffered very serious injuries as well. In 58 days of Operation Al-Badr, as the TTP called it, 
in 58 days of operation al badr 39 security forces personnel were killed and that is only up to may 29 39 security forces personnel killed in 58 days in fact if we check the south asia terrorism portal satb we see that in 56 days preceding this 58 days right while there was no operation al badr on then again 24 pakistani security forces personnel had been killed in fact if you keep an count on a on a monthly basis i would say generally that the level of casualties suffered by pakistani armed forces along their western borders against terrorists is it not more than at least three times more i think it's about four times more than those suffered by indian security forces say in the kashmir valley and thereabouts speaking on ttp's behalf is their spokesman who's called mohammad khurasani now i don't know if khurasani is his real name or it's just a just a nom de guerre where people take pe- people take up names fake names or or mythical names when they are fighting a war or fighting combat so khurasani if that names taken that's interesting because the islamic state unit working in the same area operating in the same area is called is islamic state khurasan pakistan so the spokesman is mohammad khurasani who said that look our ceasefire in 2021 had failed but now we see some more sincerity sincerity so let's see how this goes the news is although pakistani authorities have not confirmed it but it's widely believed that once again as a gesture of goodwill pakistani authorities have released a further 30 ttp terrorists last year for the month long ceasefire they had released about 100 now they have released about 30 more now in the middle of all this one more interesting thing has come out that is the united nations security council's monitoring team on afghanistan it has submitted its 13th report now this report apparently for the first time mentions that besides ttp al qaeda uh, daesh that is islamic state and other groups operating inside afghan territory also groups like lashkar e taiba jaish e mohammed these are groups specifically directed at india india specific groups they also exist there so far this committee which submit, submits regular reports had not said it so that made the headlines in indian newspapers indian media immediately un report says un security council monitoring, monitoring committee report says that let and jaish e mohammed are operating in afghanistan now if you ask me it would sound to me to be a little counterintuitive if pakistan has a hostile regime there and pakistan is trying to fight its own rebels there it sounds a little counterintuitive that pakistan's own assets own anti india assets will also be located there but then maybe i am being much too reasonable or much too logical and in those parts in the af pak region as it's called such logic such old fashioned conventional logic does not apply but in this report there is a catch that we should know the report says that the fact that they mentioned that <coughs> groups like lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed are there this is based on information provided by a member state they don't ma- mention which member state they also go on to say in the same report and i'm sharing a link a copy of the full report with you you will see the cover on my screen but it's a 27 page report i am sharing it fully with you you can read it it says another member state however says that this is not true now you can guess who these member states are let me just tell you that the current chair of the group the current chair of the committee is india so this report is actually signed by ts tirumurthy who is india's permanent representative at the united nations so so that fact needs to be mentioned it's also true that so far while india has been pressing the terror monitoring committee unsc's terror monitoring committee to talk about indian india specific terror groups in afghanistan they haven't done so india has also attacked them criticized them at the un india as the chair has said that this committee is plagued by political biases now as i go over the report of the committee and you also see it i am very interested in one of the annexures towards the end which lists all of the key taliban officials that is the entire cabinet chief justice deputy chief justice all the key people there in the, in the taliban administration 
and gives you an update on the on the status of sanctions on them. In which case, who all have travel bans against them? To begin with, they all have travel bans, but where have travel bans been lifted? So if you see this, out of these 30 worthies, travel bans have only been lifted as yet against eight. So Afghan Taliban administration, such as it is, continues to be a state and an administration rejected by the world, is still treated as terrorist by the world. So what their handlers in Pakistan may have expected that they will come and take over and the whole world will come in and start rebuilding and reconstructing in Afghanistan, that hasn't happened. Afghanistan now has become a state of out of sight, out of mind. Nobody cares. You might get a little more interest say in the Western commentariat, particularly among the extreme left, liberal, hard liberal side, say even of the Democratic Party, on what happens over the hijab issue, say in India's Karnataka, or what's happening in some part of India, but nobody is interested in the fact that in Afghanistan, the Taliban now have kept girls out of senior school. So Afghanistan is now a forgotten story. And Pakistan is a liability because they have to handle this Afghanistan. It is next door to them. It is not next door to India or the US. And it is there that their terrorists are growing. So these are terrorists in the backyard. You remember that old Hillary Clinton saying that you can't, you can't rear terrorists in the, in the front yard and hope the terrorists in the backyard would not strike you. So they are the ones who are striking Pakistan and Pakistan's dealing with, uh, dealing with this. That's the reason we had said, leave AF to Pak. We did not wish Pakistan terrorist violence. Nobody wishes another country terrorist violence. But if you use it as a ploy, cynically, where you find it expedient, chances are that you will be struck back by the same, by the same snakes in some other place, which is exactly what's happening. And what was going to be or what was expected to be their client state has now become a mediating state, will equal leverage, if not more. That is the Afghan Taliban.